Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for joining episode eight of my new segment where I interview and chat with other pet professionals about all sorts of topics related to animals and animal care, whether it's dog training, dog care, dog health, dog nutrition, dog rescue, dog whatever. I try to bring in a variety of guests to talk about content that kind of aligns with my channel. And today I have yet another special guest and I am super excited to welcome Gabriella McAllister. Gabby, thanks for joining. Hey, nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. And now, Gabriella, she, uh, she is into energy healing. And if anyone has seen a couple of my other segments or followed me for any number of uh, years on social media, I'm obviously very big into energy and the spiritual relationship between animals and, and animal caregivers. And uh, Gabby is the, uh, she's the president and founder or whatever you are of Connected Energy Healing. <laughs> so first and foremost, introduce yourself. Give us a couple of minutes of who the hell Gabriella is. Okay, well, yeah, a couple of minutes. I will I'll keep this as brief as I can because it is a story. <laughs> um, well, my name is Gabriella McAllister. I developed connected energy medicine or healing or therapy over uh, a 30 year period uh, because I was seeing gaps in um, the emotional and the physical needs of people and animals. So I was seeing gaps in um, emotional literacy with you know, human beings and with animals. Um, I was seeing with animals in particular when there were training issues, um, a lot of the animals didn't feel heard. And so our training or our education techniques kind of had a gap and the energy work that I do kind of filled that gap. And I came out professionally, I guess, about 20 years ago when I could make this my full-time practice. Uh, I come from a traditional university education. I speak three languages. I went into uh, corporate very quickly. I was literally recruited out of college by two different places. One was the State Department for the Foreign Service. The other one was a top 10 pharmaceutical ad agency. And in 91, <laughs> Yes, I just dated myself <laughs> when I graduated. <laughs> um, there were no jobs and I literally got recruited by two different places. And, you know, just like any young person, I went for the money, you know, so I went with the ad agency and it was, as you heard me say, pharmaceutical specific. And that was back way back when, when pharmaceutical, when you did advertising or marketing, it was direct to doctors, not direct to consumers like it is today. So there was no consumer marketing. So we were literally advertising and selling for the pharmaceutical companies to doctors. And so I learned a lot about Western medicine very, very quickly. I saw the corporate environment and basically I, I kind of figured out in my corporate environment that I wasn't doing my mission and purpose. I have all these other skill sets um, for doing energy medicine, along with energy medicine, it was interesting, you know, people always want to put you in a box. You do energy medicine, you're a medium, you're a psychic, you're an animal communicator. They have like, they want to put you in a box. And the thing is, typically, or the way I do energy medicine, you have to have access to all those skills to really be of service to figure out where the gaps are, as well as understanding the emotional and the physical issues of, you know, in this particular case, because we're talking about dogs, <laughs> my one of my favorite species, um, you want to be able to cover all those aspects because the way I developed connected energy is so that you can literally, you have to look at the energetic, the emotional source of disease, which, you know, was basically pioneered by Louise Hay from Hay House. And then the physical issues, because you have to address all three to address issues that may be traditional veterinary medicine or maybe even other forms of holistic medicine can address. And then also you have to understand the emotional source of what's going on in order to understand why that animal is acting the way they act if they are not responding to traditional training. So that's kind of how I came about, but I work with both people and animals. And it's really funny because you'll see when people go to my website, I have mostly photos of animals, you know, everything from polar bears, dolphins, dogs, horses, uh, snakes, um, to, um, 
you know, even I fish, everything, you know, I've been able to communicate with, but inevitably the person will say, if you could do that for my dog, can you help me? And then I inevitably end up with the human client, if you will. And so my practice is actually 50-50, 50% people, 50% other species. So that's kind of how it came about. And I didn't come out professionally until I could do it 110% support myself, support my rescue animals, do everything I need to do. Because for me, because I had a traditional education, I was very business and analytically oriented. I, this was a profession to me. Like it, at the ad agency, I was billed out for over $400 an hour. I didn't see what I do today as any less important. As, as a matter of fact, more important, right? Because um, you're saving a lot of times animals' lives. Dogs are, you know, labeled rogues or labeled a bad dog. And it's literally just a misunderstanding, a gap in communication, a gap in really figuring out why that animal is having a hard time adjusting to our human world. Excellent. So that's, that's, I think that was kind of short, but it was a little that's, long. It was um, a process to get here. That's okay. Yeah. And it always is. It should be. It should be a journey, right? Yeah. Uh, it, well, it, yeah. A journey to mission and purpose, right? right you know, that, I think yeah. if more people found their mission and purpose, like I work seven days a week, I don't take vacations. Yeah. See, you're raising your hand too, because you found mission and purpose yeah. through what you do. And when you really truly love your career, it's all consuming. So I can be on vacation and I'm taking clients and my husband will look at me and say, you know, have you, uh, we're on vacation. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I don't need a vacation from my life. This is what it's about for me. So he's like, well, as long as you're happy, okay, I'm going wherever I'm going. I'll see you in a couple hours. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's all. I, and I, I share that with, you know, obviously friends, followers, and fans of mine, but also students that, you know, I, I have my own dog training school too, but I share with them also, you know, that, that when, when you're doing something you love, even if you're doing it seven days a week and 30 hours longer than your old job, you're, it just doesn't feel like work. It just doesn't. It really no, doesn't. You, you actually feel more jazzed and more energized when you're in it because you're just, you're having those wonderful aha moments. You're seeing the, the change that occurs when you're really helping an animal in their person or you're teaching somebody to really get it and they, and they get it and you just get so impassioned by it that you're having a ball. Yeah. Absolutely. And before we get into uh, uh, connected, connected energy healing, uh, if anyone, you know, whoever's watching, if you want to check out Gabrielle's website, I'll throw the link right down there. I'll also put it in the description so you could check her out. She's on the, you're, you're in Chicago, the Chicago area. No, no, I'm actually down in Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, okay. You're in Oklahoma. Okay. Which doesn't matter. And we'll get into the distance healing aspect of, of your, your work as well. But it doesn't matter where anyone is. They could still go to your website, check you out, and hire you. So, uh... <laughs> yeah. I mean, people, initially, if people are not familiar with energy medicine and how I do things, they'll say, well, how on earth can you help me over the phone or over Skype or, or Zoom? And I'll say, well, um, your iPhone. This is the best analogy I have for en energy medicine. And they're like, yeah. And I said, do you understand the technology that makes your iPhone connect without wires or anything? Can you explain to me the iPhone technology? <laughs> well, no. Then why do you buy a thousand dollar phone? Well, cause it works. That's me. That's anybody yeah. who's credible in the business that actually does the work the right way. You will see results. Um, to the point where I worked with a new person yesterday and they were um, up in Washington state and they had a chiropractic issue on top of the other things that we were working on with the dog. And I said, the dog's hips are out. And she was like, yeah, uh, I didn't tell you that. And I said, yeah, no, I'm a medical intuitive. That's, that's why you hired me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, so give me a minute. And let me fix that. And she heard the click shift, saw the whole dog's body move as the dogs passed out asleep and said, I can't believe that just happened. And I said, why not? Well, you're not here. Hmm. Everything is connected because everything is energy. Like, you know, from, pra from practicing Reiki, all matter 
is frozen energy. So if everything technically at its core level is energy, then everything is naturally connected. You don't have to send anything or do woo woo or weird stuff. It's just there. And it's it, it, the ironic thing about um, people who are not as open to energy and they're more focused on textbook science, et cetera. The foundation of all science is matter and energy. Which, Absolutely. Yeah, you know, which I mean, I'm not a scientist. I don't profess to be. You know, I, I don't have a PhD in any kind of uh, you know traditional science, but I do know that the foundation of all science is matter and energy. But so, all right. So let's get let's get right to it. what exactly is connected healing energy. If you can explain that to to viewers who may be interested in hearing about it. Well, what I found, um, you know. So I have this traditional education, including law school. So I'm highly analytical as well as being really intuitive. And so when I started researching what my skill set was and what I actually could do, and it meant studying a lot of different things. And it was back before, you know, Bastyr and all those other, you know, alternative universities were available to teach about this kind of alternative medicine. I started to look at, you know, people were doing things in a very siloed manner. What I mean by that is, you know, a Western doctor was over here and had their point of view. A Chinese medicine doctor was over here and had their point of view. Um, a yoga instructor, instructor was over here and had their narrow point of view. And then psychology, and it all follows suit, right? Everybody is in this very narrow path that they study. And this is their expertise. And what I found was the gap of why things were not functioning. Like, why weren't people healing? If you go to the doctor, why aren't you getting better? If you have a training problem, why, aren't, why isn't it getting fixed by the trainer in, in some circumstances? If you're going to a veterinarian, why isn't the, the issue being solved? And what I literally kind of figured out was because everybody is working in such a siloed way, that's not the way we work. We are an energetic being. We are an emotional being and a physical being. And it's like, I call it the three, the three legged stool of health. And so, yes, obviously like since childhood, I, I would always have sick people. My parents noticed it. Can you put Gabby on the bed? For some reason, we just feel better when she sits here. Wow. You know, there was just, that and my parents saw me talking to animals and they were very catholic and so it was at first don't tell anybody shh you know they're people in Hoo -hoo. and <sighs> then it was you're imagining things and there's nothing worse for a young person especially going through that period of time you know you're 10 and then going into high school people telling you you're nuts and it's already a hard enough period of time so i was smart enough thank goodness that I said, okay, obviously something's going on here that other people don't understand. So I started studying on my own since high school while pursuing a traditional track. And that's what I kind of saw was the siloed thing, as well as like entering my professional career. I walked in to the ad agency and the misery that I saw, I mean, there was tons of money, people very wealthy, people, you know, flying places, you know, fancy clothing, fancy cars, but they were still all miserable. And I was like, okay, so they're really good at their jobs, but they're not impassioned by what they do. They're, they're sad. And then, you know, when I started looking at the animal world, like with dogs, um, I actually, it's funny, I'll get into this in a little bit if, if you'll let me, but I have three Native American horses, they're Mustangs. And in some Native American languages, the name for horse is actually big dog. And my three Choctaw Spanish Mustangs act like big dogs. Yeah, I saw the one act. he was rolling around in the dirt. That was awesome. Yes. I love it. Yeah. And then his, and did you hear him as I was like, he was like literally saying to me, I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. You know, we had a long workout lady. I'm, yeah. I'm finished. He's my four year old, but people will comment all the time. They act like big dogs. It's like you've trained them like dogs. And I said, well, I've educated them they're so much larger than me, but I've educated them. Yes. Like I've educated my German shepherds, but I saw all these gaps in education for animals 
because of all the siloing. And so I came up with this three-legged stool, you know, the energetic, the emotional, the physical, in order to bring those three together. So whether it is a physical problem with a dog, a training problem with a dog, um, behavioral problems, you know, emotional disturbances, you know, I sit on the board of directors for Rescue Me Incorporated in Los Angeles that has one of the best reputations I've ever seen for over 20 plus years. They're internationally recognized. I mean, we all know that animals that are rescued have severe issues, just like humans do, but within the context of their species. That's the caveat. Because when I was young, people would say, you treat dogs and animals like they're people. And I'm like, no, they have all the same range of emotion that we have, all the same issues we have, but within the context of their species. And if you can get that, you can do so much more education and reach that animal so much more effectively in order for them to be okay in the human world. Because let's face it, dogs have kind of a hard proposition, don't they? They have, one, they have to learn dog language. And usually that's all messed up because we don't know how to socialize them properly, the majority <laughs> of people, right? Okay, so they have a hard enough time understanding their own, which we do too, right? Talk about connection. Humans don't even understand themselves, for goodness sake. So how are we expected to educate dogs to understand dogs properly? And then they have the second problem. They have to learn how to be in the human world when they are completely other species and some of their behaviors are diametrically opposed to ours. Dogs have it incredibly hard. So when you put those three together, in particular with dogs, whether, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's health, or behavioral issues or emotional psychological trauma you get results so much faster yeah and i like it i mean I, I agree with everything you're saying especially because yes i'm a dog <laughs> trainer but i also have a background in nutrition obviously i'm a, a, a reiki practitioner and you know i've had a connection to animals my whole life uh, and you know fortunately for me and, and you know I, I i don't believe there's a one size fits all i'm and I, I agree with you that, you know, when people say, oh, you're a dog trainer, I said, I am, but I consider myself a holistic pet care practitioner. And the first thing they say is, oh, food? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, when, when you see a bag of dog food that says <coughs> holistic dog food, that in and of itself doesn't make sense. <laughs> because, you know, what, and for anyone yes. watching, what, what Gabriella was just talking about, you know, where there's silos of professionals like super focused on what they do, uh, by definition, they cannot be holistic. And that's why when I work with people, I'm like, look, yeah, okay, I'm a trainer. Yeah, sit down, come stay off. I'll teach your dog all that stuff. That's such a small segment of their happiness, right? That's such a small part of what's going to help them become the best versions of themselves. We're talking, yes, training, environment, nutrition, behavior, exercise, mental stimulation, you name it. We have to address the dog's whole life to achieve balance. And that's kind of my view when I'm working with, you know, with dogs. Exactly. And with dogs, it's um, what you're talking about then goes really more, you know, we're struggling, you and I, and anybody that does what we do, we struggle with language because there's no real language that is acceptable that describes what we do because everything is so naturally siloed. So when people say you're a dog train, you know, oh, you're a dog trainer, sit, come, stay, everything that you said. But then you start, start saying, well, we need to look at nutrition. We need to look at this. We need to look at that. They look at you like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not training. Actually, for it to be effective training, all those aspects must be, which then there's a closer word that gets to it, which I've started to use it more, and they're using it more in human health, integrative care. So integrated training. And it's funny that you do dog training. I understand dog training. I've obviously trained my own dogs, but I'm not a professional trainer. I've worked with Warren Eckstein. Um, God, I love that man. Um, he makes me happy. <laughs> um, but, you know, I did, I worked in training and development for human beings. And I've done everything from coach CEOs all the way down to sales staff. And I'll tell you, 
there's a lot more in common with training and development with humans and canines than people would think, even training a horse. It's the same concept. And so that's where I kind of, you know, again, we struggle with language, with training. It has a connotation to it. I am telling the dog either using food or praise to sit. And I want to get the dog to do that. The question is, like when I have animals that are problemed animals, quote unquote problemed, they'll bring me a dog that's resistant to training. And I'll be like, okay. And nine times out of 10, if there's no trauma, okay. So we're not dealing with a rescue. We're dealing with a balanced animal here. Nine times out of 10, the dog looks at me and goes, why do I have to sit for you? I'm not a, cir I'm not a circus. This is not a trick. Why do I have to please you to sit? And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're, nobody is giving the dog the context of why. And in training and development, the why is absolutely imperative for behavior change, any kind of behavior change, when it, whether it's you're dealing with a human, you're dealing with a horse or a dog, the why is the most important. So that's why like early on in my practice, doing the energy work that I do, connected energy works more on the subconscious level to change an individual from within, kind of making it their idea, which is so much better than you going, nah, 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 communicating at a dog. Because trust me, dogs are like people. You can sit there and say and try to reason with them. And the dog's like, mm, I don't think I want to do that. Just because you can talk to them doesn't mean you're going to change that what, they, what they're doing. You have to find those three components, kind of like that magic thing that helps the dog shift. Usually that magic thing is the why. So like, for example, when I, we just rescued a dog out of Texas. <clears throat> so I'm so sorry if you guys hear me coughing. I uh, developed a, a cold from my allergies, so I'm struggling. That's why you see me with the water to keep myself from coughing too much. That's okay. So we, we um, through my rescue, so I have a big black German shepherd. He's an East German dog. Warren actually had to help me with Baldor. This was the first dog I was like, I am so at a loss of how to reach this dog. Like, and he's my own personal dog. And that's one of the reasons why Warren and I get along so well. He was like, you have no ego. I'm like, no, it's about the animal. And I'm not perfect. And he's mine. So of course I'm gonna, I may be too close to it, right? I, was, so just, said, I was just thinking that sometimes our emotions for our own animals gets in the way. Right. The attachment. We have right. an attachment and expectation. Mm. And so that's the biggest trick for anybody doing work is to lose the attachment to the outcome or what you think the outcome should be. And so, you know, Warren said he was doing some filming. Did I want to bring Baldor down? Well, he did some amazing things that day that were so simple. And I was just tickled pink by it. And Baldor was happier than I've ever seen him. Like the big smile of the German shepherd. And I never forgot that. Like I thought to myself, he did something so, I won't get into exactly what it is because it's so unconventional that most training methods, like people would freak out, but with Baldur it worked and Warren knew when to apply that. And it was something really crazy and, and innovative, nothing harsh. It was just something that you wouldn't do with every animal out there. So cut to nine years later, we're looking for a friend to, for, for Baldor. We pick up this dog through Rescue Me Incorporated. His name happened to be Thor. Kind of kismet, right? I have Baldor, one Viking god. I get Thor, the next Viking god. Two years old, dumped twice before the age of two. Wow. He's over 100 pounds. He is a big boy. He, he looks like he has East and West German lines in him because he's so big boned and big. Um, really lovely, lovely dog. And the trauma that this poor animal had, I, I kind of was a little bit worried when he came in. He bonded to my husband immediately, which is what we wanted because my, my husband lost his 15 year old dog. And literally, this dog acclimated to our environment like grease light. So everybody started asking me, how did you do that? How did you do that? I'm like, emotional literacy. It's not just pure training. Um, you've really got to understand the psychological aspects, the energetic aspects, and then the physical aspects. Like 
like you were saying that you have to address diet with training. Absolutely. The gut brain connection, as significant as it is for people, it's significant massively. If you, if you give dogs junk food, it's going to be like putting a two-year-old on, on, on M&Ms going on to an <laughs> eight hour flight. You know uh -huh. what I mean? It's like, it's horrible. So, you know, this dog acclimated so quickly and it, it's like I was saying, and I'll back up and I'm so sorry. I just, my ADD goes into play. Oh, it's um, all good. Emotional literacy is, is what I was taught in training and development for people. And when I saw one of the gaps in training and development for dogs, I went, emotional literacy for animals. And the key to that is put yourself in the dog's shoes, the dog's species, how they think, what their motivators are. And like I said, nine times out of 10, when you don't have trauma and you have a really smart dog that's not cooperating, they don't understand the why. I mean, he, to this day, if I ask Baldor to do something, any of the dogs I've worked with and my dogs walk the talk. Let me tell you, I take my dogs everywhere and people are like, you have such control. And I giggle. They're like, why are you laughing? We're playing you a compliment. I'm like, tell me I have control over 200, over hundred pound animals is like, is, is really a load of horse hockey. I was like, this is not control. This is understanding relationship and education. And when I ask my dogs to do something, they know it's not, ooh, let me impress you with the tricks my dog can do. It's safety. Everything. Sit, stay, lay down, walking, healing, come, all that stuff. I always relate back to safety with my dogs. Because I'll tell them, you and I, were, we're a team. And in order for us to operate in this crazy human world, because there's lots of humans that are not going to understand you, we have to function as a team. So if we're in a human situation, like we're at a park and there's skateboarding and a lots of stimulation, it's like, you guys have to stay right with me because not everybody's going to understand you. So I have to keep you safe. And then there are times that I've been traveling across the country where my dogs will sense something that they don't like. And they've figured out how to warn me about bad situations that are not aggressive, but I can tell, like when Balor puts both his ears down and gives me a long stare, there's a person in the area that he does not trust. And he lets me know it unequivocally without causing a big deal, barking, growling, snarling, which would scare other people, right? So I've literally, through education, and that emotional literacy taught my, my dogs in that way. So people will tell me you have control and you know that that's, <laughs> it's relationship. It's not control. Everything is, especially, I mean, from a dog training perspective, especially, I mean, I, I've been in rescue a long time too. I've been in, yep. my, my wife and I, you know, we've been involved in rescue since 2002 and if you establish that trusting relationship right away, which, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I could say that sometimes I use food to motivate them to come to me and, you know, the mechanical aspect of trying to get a fearful animal towards you. Yeah, of course I would do that. But when I take in a dog with a, a past or a history or an unknown history and they have apprehension and I'm not quite sure and I can't identify it, I mean, I don't even worry about that stuff. We'll just go walk. I don't care if they're pulling. I don't care what they're doing. I want them to make choices, actually, because if I'm affording them the opportunity to make choices, which later on I could always help them make their choices align with my my expectations if need be. But that's it. But you're taking the time to get to know them. See, like yeah. by you saying, let's just go for a walk and be in each other's company and observe you're getting a broader view of what's going on. And then you can say, here's how I'm going to help you to make better choices that yeah. are going to work better for you in this human world. And you're right. Like I'm not opposed to using food. It's the ones that are using food, like throughout the training process, like early on, you do want to use it because you're just starting to educate. Heck, they do it with us. You want a cookie? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Two years old. Right? Yeah. If you do this, I'll give you a cookie and some chocolate milk. You're yeah. sitting there going, heck yes. <laughs> I'm 47. I'll still do anything for a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. So food motivation is 
not always a bad thing. But yeah. Yeah. as far as like, it's, it's evolving the relationship. There are moments that, yeah, you know, we get our treats still as adults, you know, and the boys, you know, sometimes we'll have a rough weekend because I'm working a lot of hours or I have to deal with the horses a lot more. And I'll come home and I'll be like, you guys have been so good. I was like, I have a yum yum for you too. And they just know that word, yum yum. And they're like sitting in front of me, looking at me like, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they know it's because I understand that they've been especially good when I've had long days. Yeah, that's amazing. And, it, I, and I forgot to bring up, and I'll, I'll throw the link down there, but uh, for anyone watching, and I'll, again, I'll put the link here and I'll drop it in the, the comments below, but there's a really cool video of Gabriella working on an Arctic wolf. And I bring that up because wolves are like my favorite animals. Um, so they're amazing. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll drop that link below. But uh, I, 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 I honestly, I could talk to you for like hours more. Um, so uh, maybe I can, I can coax Gabriella and coming back on so we could talk more in depth. But for the purpose of time, uh, any, any last, uh, last minute advice, suggestions, or tidbits you want to offer to my viewers? Not necessarily, I mean, it can be obviously about your work, but anything else that you can offer any advice about? You know, being open to the possibilities about energy medicine and how it all works together. It, you know, energy medicine can't stand alone. Emotional development cannot stand alone. Physical development cannot stand alone. All three have to work together. And really, Animal communication is part of energy medicine. You know, you, you can't do energy medicine and not be communicating at some level because thoughts are energy. You know, language is energy. So it's, it really is all connected. And so I always tell people when it might seem a little far out there for them, just look at what National Geographic's been doing since 2007. The more, the, the first article came out in 2007 for National Geographic about animal communication, about other species having human language and having understanding beyond what we even comprehended. And if you look from 2007 on, the amount of articles talking about animal communication from National Geographic is absolutely like staggering it's just the whole google page will explode with all the the articles and they just came out with one i think two months ago again like don't discount it and they were talking about domestic animals wild animals so please you know this is not a far out there thing this is actually something that is coming into reality and the analogy i'll give as i, I leave your listeners is there was a, a while ago where everybody believed the world was flat <laughs> and, a few, and a few people came around saying, no, actually, it's round. And the people who said it was round were thrown in jail. They were heretics. They were crazy people. And here we are in 2020. And guess what? The world is round, folks. So medicine or Western medicine is, is always learning. And just because there's something we can't completely describe yet doesn't mean it, it is not real. It is just beyond our comprehension of understanding still. Excellent. And yeah, and just to add to that, especially if there's anyone watching, and I understand that energy healing, uh, the spiritual aspect of humans and animals, it, it's not something that everyone is open to. And I, I, and I offer this not just to pet owners or animal owners, uh, but pet professionals. Consider, that's all I'm asking, not so much for you, but for your ability to further help animals, just be open to the spiritual aspect of the human animal relationship. So that's my spiel on it. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you, Gabrielle. I appreciate you, you joining in and I'm hoping, hopefully like I said, hopefully I coax you to come back on for another half hour so we could talk more, but. Uh, I, I would love to. That would be awesome. Uh, and hopefully everyone enjoyed this. And if, this, if you're new to my channel, take a peek around. If you like what you see and you want to stay up to date on dog care, dog training, dog health, dog rescue, dog whatever, consider subscribing. Click that bell so you get notified when I upload new content. And we both appreciate you guys being here and we hope you got something out of this and we'll see you all soon.